So, good afternoon, everybody. Can I just check that you can hear me okay at the back? Can somebody give me a wave? Fabulous, thanks. Um, look, um, many thanks for the invite to speak, and, and again, thank you to the previous speaker, and my thanks in advance to the uh, colleagues at the back in the translation booth who do a fantastic job and generally don't really get much thanks. So, thank you to them. I trust you've all had a very good day so far. Uh, the agenda looks fantastic. This is the last session. I'm aware that you know I stand here between you and the door, um, so I'll be as quick as I can. We'll try and keep it as upbeat as we can. And um, again, what I want to do with you is share you some, some insights, uh, really, of my 30 years traveling around the world, working in and attending to different global healthcare systems. So. Um, first of all, congratulations on the topic. Um, as somebody who grew up in Belfast and in Manchester in the terms of the bombings, um, I'm very familiar with uh, major event management. And somebody who grew up and was trained by the NHS in the UK, I, again, um, I'm very beneficial for what a healthcare service can add. Um, I've also worked for a major vendor at a time when uh, there's been a major recall on one of their global C-arm offerings. So I know what it's like to work inside the space in terms of dealing with patients, in terms of risk and emergencies and, and major events, but also looking at it from a biomed point of view and trying to deal with a technology platform when some of that's being taken away from you. So the rigor and the process that really you put into dealing with the risk management in the hospital environment and what you put into dealing with um, planning for those events is critical. Um, all I can hope, honestly, from hand of my heart, is that you never have to use it, but be prepared. So um, what I'd like to share with you today is my view of a global healthcare system, which is made up of multiple subsystems, share with you some of the trends that are going on in those environments and share with you the impact uh, that you are likely to experience as fellow uh, facilities management professionals. So what I'm going to start with is a brief introduction um, to OCS, just to make sure we're all on the same page and you understand where I'm coming from. Um, my personal vision for healthcare and what it is that we're seeking to deliver some key themes that are evolving that you need to be aware of and need to be planning to consider uh, as you move forward, what the impact of those are likely to be on your day-to-day -day activities, and then finally share with you some examples of how those are going to play out and some of the things that you might want to consider. It's not my job to try and educate you on, on risk management and managing major events. So um, I'm, I'm here to learn in that respect. But what I would like to do is share with you my experience. Now, all of the pages that you'll see on the screen are all to be shared with you. Uh, you'll be able to download them, etc. And there's no need to take photographs or make notes. Uh, you can just take the pages as, uh, as you wish. So um, that's me. Let's get started. Um, and hopefully at the end, if you wish, uh, there will be time for questions so that we can, we can engage accordingly. So. Introduction to OCS Group UK. Uh, we are a UK company. Um, we've won many accolades. We are one of the oldest companies in the UK. There are a range of uh, organizations in the world. Um, many, many organizations are uh, much younger, um, but not many that are older. So um, still very much a family company and we carry very much family values. We do an awful lot of charitable work. A large number of our employees uh, are people with minor disabilities, etc. So very important for us to carry on that family ethos. So as I say, headquartered in the UK, we have a footprint all around the world. Um, we have nearly 100,000 staff now. We offer a range of services. Uh, I'll specifically show you those on the next pages uh, that we provide into healthcare. And then for um, the services that we provide, we provide them in nearly 50 countries. So we are very much uh, a global company, but also very much a friendly family face. Now, Thailand. Um, so we have a broad and diverse operation in Thailand. Um, again, uh, lots of staff, lots of locations. We're not just focused in one area of the country. We have a very broad uh, appetite for business and we run north to south, east to west. 
Now, for those of you that have driven up and down the roads and, and had fun trying to park your car, no doubt at some point in, in your career, your life, you will have seen someone with a PCS vest or an OCS vest. I think this is perhaps what we're known for in the, in the Thai market, and that's what we're most visible for. Um, in terms of our hard facilities management offering, again, um, you'll know Common Asia, and for those of you that, that like to eat or have the uh, fondness to eat, uh, the Food House brand will, of course, be well known to you. Canon, uh, Canon Hygiene, Canon Pest Control also make up part of the family, as do several other companies which are not particularly relevant to the FM environment. So OCS is, is a broad entity, uh, and we provide these services uh, globally without restriction. So, let's get into the, the topic for today, which is healthcare. Um, for us, healthcare has become now um, our global priority. Our focus is to enable our clients, our hospital clients, our primary care clients, our community care clients, to be able to deliver clinical excellence. Our job is to provide a solid foundation for the provision of healthcare. And in so doing, we allow clinical continuity. So clinical continuity means that there is no interruption to the clinical provision of service. What is becoming very clear is that to be successful in this space, the patient service needs to be enhanced. And that's also is what we're really looking to drive into the markets now. And you'll see when we speak with major global providers like Cleveland and Mayo and UCLA, they all talk about the patient experience. The clinical impact on patient experience, you have less than 25% of touch time with those patients. The other 75% of interactions comes from the facility and facility-related staff. And it really is worth bearing that in mind. So the big question is, how do you integrate all of these components on the screen to get a seamless delivery of that service? How do you integrate the technology, the facility, the process, and the people? It's not as easy as it sounds, but those are the three pillars that you need to address. So our goal is to provide safe, efficient care environments. This is really what we want to achieve. So to do that, we bring global expertise and we put it into a local delivery package, which is designed with the client. So, in essence, we're providing a solid foundation for the delivery of clinical excellence. Clinical excellence, clinically excellent outcomes is what everybody is seeking. Now, um, big page, lots of detail, which is why it's probably good that this is, this is being passed to you. But in essence, um, the light blue areas are soft facilities management, the purple areas are hard facilities management, dark blue, management and administration, and so on and so forth. We as a company provide all of this around the world. In some markets, we provide a little less. In some markets, we provide a bit more. But this is the basis of what is required to provide that foundation to be able to enable clinical excellence. Now, big global themes. So, the next page goes smaller. So if you can focus on this one, um, it, will, it will help. So what I've tried to do is rate the impact for you. And again, this is my personal opinion. For you, you might decide something at the bottom of the list is more impactful. So what we're seeing more and more globally um, is that providers are going to start being paid by insurers and by patients for health outcomes, not for activity. So just because a patient's been through your facility doesn't mean that you're going to get paid. If the patient goes through and gets cured or is well treated, then maybe you get paid. So the certainty around revenues for healthcare providers is going to change, and that's coming around as a wave now. So what we're starting to see is that providers of services to healthcare facilities are being asked to follow the same model of payment. So what you might find is that your healthcare provider is now asking you to allow to be, get paid uh, on the same basis that they are. And this is called matching revenue to cost. The next one that's, that's very high, um, and it really has been driven in the developing healthcare economies, sorry, correction, the developed healthcare economies, is this concept of moving healthcare um, so that it's organized around the patient. What we tend to see today is that healthcare is organized by bringing the patients to the healthcare facility. What we're going to start to see very quickly 
is that healthcare is going to be organized around the patient. And this is being enabled by technology, but it's going to have a material impact on yourselves as FM providers as to what the healthcare facility actually is, because at the end of the day, that could well turn out to be a patient's home. The next one really is the rising consumerism. Um, you know, this is fueled uh, by um, retail, um, a lot of social media, and what's happening is that the patient will show up in front of the doctor with a report out from Google on the condition that they think they've got. And if they don't think they've got that condition, they've got another report out for the condition that they think they might also have. So they come to the doctor very well armed with information and they expect the outcome. Uh, and they expect the doctor to provide some degree of um, additional information to that. So they're coming now um, from a point of view where they're quite distrustful of the medical profession, and that's providing challenges on the clinical side. What we're also seeing is a very strong rise in wellness. So to match acute facilities, to match community facilities, to match primary care facilities, we're also seeing a very rapidly developing market for wellness environments. So these are spa, gym-type environments that also provide um, executive checkups, also provide ladies' services and female health care. On the high side, you've got some interesting positions. We're seeing a lot of consolidation globally. So certainly in the US market, we're seeing a lot of healthcare chains being absorbed by other healthcare chains, a lot of primary care providers being absorbed vertically, vertically into tertiary care providers. Now, I think the best example of an integrated care network now that you can see globally is probably Kaiser Permanente in California. Mayo Clinic coming up behind, but a lot, lot smaller. So we're seeing a lot of systems-based thinking. Um, collaboration, partnering, this is very much seen as the way forward. No one organization now believes that it can satisfy the healthcare agenda. The only way that you can do it is to team up and to collaborate. Uh, the last one that I'm going to speak to really is the emerging markets. And whilst I don't particularly view Thailand as an emerging market, I view it as a quasi-emerged market. What I would say is that it is this type of market that is driving innovation now. The existing developed markets are saturated. There's a lack of systems thinking in those markets and a lack of willingness to experiment. The willingness to drive innovation and experiment is coming from this part of the world, which is one of the key reasons for, for being in this part of the world. So, um, as I said, the next page gets a bit smaller, but uh, I'll just pick up on, on, on some of those. So. Um, Again, you have these pages to enjoy. Um, on the first one, where providers' revenues are dropping down, so we've already mentioned you're going to have to align your own income streams to those, community home-based. Um, the idea of hospital at home is coming. It's well thought out in Germany and France, very well entrenched. You're going to see it here, okay? The concept of aged care, the concept of assisted living, they're all coming. It's just a matter of time. Uh, we've discussed patient experience. Um, the drive to client purchasing power, um, we are seeing large procurement groups coming through now in various parts of the world, and this is to try and drive efficiency and optimization in the procurement process, which honestly for most healthcare systems is very random and not very efficient. Look, I'm going to stop that page there, uh, just in the interest of time. Um, and the three main examples I want to speak to here are convergence, which is a technological convergence, consumerism, and this, this drive to collaborate, this willingness to collaborate and to partner. So these are the three themes I just want to go a bit deeper on. So if we look at consumerism, sorry. Okay, that page should say convergence, I do apologize. Um, so this is really all about digital and the impact that digital is having. So the, the hypothesis here is that all technologies are converging together, all information is available to all people the same way, um, and my own hypothesis is that the acute sector globally is going to remain flat. There won't be much growth in bed count, but what you are going to see is a big increase in intermediate care facilities, step-down facilities, which are facilities um, that require less skilled nursing intubation, less medical intubation, and then we will go down to the hospital at home. So you're going to see big growth in the step-down facilities, big growth in the hospital at home. 
So the impact of this is that you're going to have healthcare delivered in different environments. Very easy now to come in and have a cardiology workup, get fitted with a remote monitor and sent back home, have it hooked up to your smartphone and all the information beamed into the hospital. Doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. Why do you need to be in hospital? Okay, you don't. Um, we're also going to see uh, a value shift from devices and products, um, and I apologize to the heavy iron vendors outside. Um, you know, there's some big equipment vendors out there. What we're seeing now is that they are effectively becoming data collection devices. What's more important is the information that flows from them and the management of that information in terms of healthcare. So, all of these things is going to stimulate a new way of delivering healthcare. It's going to drive the aged care agenda, and as the demographics shift, we're going to have a very interesting um, period as we see those facilities evolve. Um, the healthcare pathways are being disrupted. Uh, again, you'll have experienced that all yourselves. For those of you particularly working on the biomed front, you'll have seen very many different examples of how those pathways are being challenged. Uh, the one bit really that, that FM's not really got into yet, and having come from uh, a large engineering background and used this a lot on aircraft engines, predictive analytics is coming. And it's just a matter of time as to how it's used and how it intervenes in our day-to-day -day activity. You see it on some medical technology now, where they're trying to predict the failover times. And you see it on some of the IT systems where they're trying to predict compression points in the data flow. Um, it is going to come in using AI, artificial intelligence, to look at some of the clinical aspects as well. And we're starting to see certainly a lot of uh, mammography screening now is having uh, a strong AI input, and there's a lot of computer-aided diagnosis creeping in. Consumerism. Um, if you want to be a good healthcare provider going forward, you really have to get good with this stuff. Um, as mentioned, they're all very well informed. They know what they want. They come knowing what they want. Um, and they almost come with their own diagnosis. So they can be quite challenging. But what's going to separate the healthcare providers is the experience that that patient has from when they enter that facility to when they leave that facility. Think about your own experience going through a retail mall. Think about your own experience if you go and decide to buy a Mini, if you decide to go and buy an Audi. Very different experience. Okay? And this is how the healthcare providers globally now are trying to position themselves. I mentioned before, 75% of all touch time with patients is not clinical. It's you guys. Now, um, when you look at retail and you look at industry, they have this concept of managed journeys and managed outcomes. They know where they want to get the client to, and they walk them all the way through the facility, and they direct them through all the points that they want them to interact with. This is being done now in healthcare, certainly if you look to the West Coast, uh, sorry, West Coast, North America. Um, and as again, um, we mentioned this, this idea of non-healthcare experiences. What people experience um, in other aspects of their life is driving what they expect from healthcare. And to be honest and brutally frank, healthcare is way behind and has a lot of catching up to do. Um, just very quickly to look through some of the issues where consumerism is, is impacting. So if we, we look at wayfinding, and wayfinding is navigation, it's how do you find your way around the hospital. So this is one of the big issues, as you all know, um, with clientele. So you can either have BYOD, which is bring your own device, and you can load an app onto that, and it helps you go around, around the hospital. Um, Sometimes in some facilities, the facility provides the device and it helps you navigate your way around the facility. What I would point you to is something very new, um, which is a speciality device for blind people. And it helps blind individual patients, that's a patient with no attendant, to navigate their way around a healthcare facility. So on their own, using a smartphone, they can find their way from the point of entrance to where they need to be in the facility and back out again. In terms of independence for, for disabled people, that's fantastic. And it's a charity that runs this, so it's, it's largely free of cost. Now, next one, parking. That's the second biggest problem after finding your way to the hospital. So even if you find your way to the hospital, chances are you can't get parked. Even if you can get parked, you can't find out where it is that you've got to get to. So it all makes the patient very anxious. So the patient coming into the hospital is already in a high stress environment. Now you're stressing them out even more. By the time they actually get to their appointment, they're probably uh, angry, to put it easily. 
Now, um, in terms of parking, there's some fantastic systems around. Um, you can have a simple sat-nav GPS program that will get them from their front door to your garage. You can have computer-automated preloaded programs which will navigate them to um, a healthcare campus. That will then direct them to the garage that has space. It will then direct them to a parking space. Some of the more advanced systems that are being considered allow pre-booking, pre-allocation of parking spaces so that it will only let your car in. So the guy that's trying to get in the parking space in front of you can't get in because the ramp won't go down because it's not his car parking space. Okay? So you can see how this is going to be quite, quite interesting for people. Um, a lot of these systems, to be fair, are being tested in the airport environment and they're working very well. So when you look at some of the German car parking systems, these are great and they will come, okay? Now, from a clinical point of view, portering is a big issue. You can never get a porter, which is the person that pushes the wheelchair around the hospital or takes the gurney around the hospital, you can never get one when you want one. Okay? So there are systems available now which are effectively digitizing the portering system. So for the nursing staff, it's like Uber. You just call up a porter, okay? And it says what the wait time is, and you see the little wheelchair going across the map of the hospital. Really fun systems that keep people engaged. Now, collaboration. Um, this is one of my favorite subjects. So the challenges that, that the healthcare systems have got are well known to you all, okay? You've got cost, access, quality. These cannot be solved on your own as a healthcare provider. They cannot be solved on your own as a department within a healthcare organization. The boss says he wants more money out, he wants more cost savings. How are you going to do it? You have to talk to people. So the benefits of partnering are really quite simple, that you get a very broad mindset to address your problem. You get to share the risk, both in the problem solution and in the execution. You get to match the cost and the revenue. You get speed. Typically, if you partner and collaborate for a solution, it's a lot, lot faster than just trying to figure it out yourself. And you'll also get different perspectives, depending on the type of organization that you engage with. And we do a lot of partnering, a lot of collaborating. One of the great benefits for the clients is that we bring that global perspective. We bring a different way of thinking. Now, for the partnering to work, okay, this is the secret source. So for the partnering to work, you have to have a partner who is enlightened, who wants to do something different. These are the four criteria I look for when I look for a partner organization. That we can align our mission and the client's mission, and that there's a willingness to contract for value, not to transact for dollars or baht or pounds. And that the C-suite, that means the chief executive and all of his direct reports are committed to doing business in this way and are committed to trying to find a solution, different solution. Now, this is a project that we did in Dubai. Um, it's called the Valiant Clinic. It's done with the Houston Methodist Group out of the Texas Medical Center in the US. Fantastic project, ambulatory only. Beautiful place, bit like walking into the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. This is designed for patient experience. So when you walk in, you're met, they know you're coming, your phone's triggered the alert. All of the things that I've spoken to you about, you can see in this facility. Really good, and we have the privilege of providing the services uh, at that facility. So, just looking at the clock, um, in terms of um, uh, wrap-up, if, if I encourage you to take key points away with you, these would be there. So, most of patient expectations are informed by non-healthcare activity. Innovation is being driven by non-healthcare organizations and it's being driven in emerging and quasi-emerging markets. 75% of the interaction with patients comes from you guys, not from clinicians. The definition of what a healthcare facility is, is changing, okay? Think about it. If you're gonna be responsible and your professional career is healthcare facilities, how are you gonna deliver healthcare facilities management into somebody's home? And then technology is an enabler. Far too often, we think it's the solution. My, my advice here, spend 80% of the time defining what the problem is, 20% of the time figuring out what the solution is. We're too quick as, as healthcare people to go straight to the solution.
take time, pause, 